Hi, folks. Welcome. We're just going to give a, another minute or so here for any stragglers making their way back to the desk or couch if you're remote. Maybe go get some popcorn. Have a pretty good turnout today. Hi, Wendy. Welcome. All right. Couple more people trickling in. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for coming in today for this month's webinar, Excel Beyond the Basics. There's gonna be a lot of good stuff in here to beef up your Excel repertoire. My name is Jacob. I'm an account manager here at CompuWorks and an avid Excel user myself. Um, I always learn something new with these, so I'm really excited to uh, see what's in store today, especially with the Beyond the Basics edition here. Um, while we've got this great turnout today, I'd like to mention our upcoming event, and that's Word 101. So that will be July's event on July 26th there. So uh, be sure to check that out. That'll be the first of our Word edition, and then I'm sure we will have our Beyond the Basics following that eventually. Um, during the webinar, just some uh, quick pieces of etiquette here. We encourage questions, you know, and you can ask these either via the, uh, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or the chat button right next to that Q&A button there. We'll try and get as many questions answered during the presentation, but we will have some time after for any ones that we missed there at InSpot. Uh, for those of you who don't know, cameras and microphones are automatically disabled for webinar mode. Uh, so you don't have to worry about muting yourself or any other instances there. Usually the day after our presentations, we email a survey to all the participants. And we usually appreciate um, some feedback, you know, on however you might think we can improve there. And as always, hosting alongside me today is CompuWorks founding partner, Alan Bobbin. Hey, Alan. Uh, awesome. Thank you, Jacob. And welcome, everybody. Wow, it's really a fantastic turnout. You know, I think um, there was about 125 uh, registrations today, which is really terrific. And um, the only one that I think comes close to this one was the, the first team session we had at the kind of the, the height of the pandemic. So a real interest in this topic today. And that includes me. Um, as uh, I've mentioned before, I, I always get a lot out of these. Doesn't matter how long I've used the product. I have you know, always learn something and usually a lot. So I'm excited about this, this topic too. Um, I did want to just uh, put something out there for folks to, to consider. And you know, Jacob mentioned the survey that we send out, and you can expect to see that tomorrow. We know your you, you know email boxes get flooded with uh, with mail, and you may not have time to to do that. But we do like to collect some feedback in terms of what you're interested in uh, as topics in in the future. Um, so if anything comes to mind, you know things that you've thought about, just enter them in the chat today, and we'll collect that information. It might just be a quicker, easier way to get that information from you. And the other thing I'll, I'll put out there as a question to the group is, would there be interest in, um, if we do these monthly now, would there be interest in a more frequent, um, you know, uh, cycle of these sessions if we did one, you know, twi twice a month or maybe, you know, added one every two months, if there was some, you know, frequency that would be, you know, more than once a month, would that be interesting to you? I know everybody has busy schedules, so it's taking time away from 
from everything else. So just a, curious to get your feedback on that. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe Lynn. And if you, any, if you guys have been on our calls before, you recognize Joe Lynn Reen. Uh, she has been teaching Microsoft apps since, uh, well, for, for a long time, since they were released, she says. So that's, that's quite a while, probably as long as me, maybe not quite as long as me. Uh, she's a certified trainer and Microsoft master instructor with over 30 years experience. She teaches on the basics to advanced features using programs like Teams, Excel, SharePoint, point outlook and more and one of the things that Jolyn does for us which I, I love and I, we get so many good uh, feedback so much good feedback on this is uh, she generally will prepare a, a workbook that goes with each class and so as we do with all of our sessions you know we're recording this session today um, this will be in our training library on our website which is compuworks.biz um, and we'll include you know, not only the recording but the associated workbook that goes along with that so it's a great resource if you know friends colleagues couldn't make this you want to share that with them you know feel free to do that and i'll also reiterate that you know we, we, we this this is really something that we invite our our clients to but um <clears throat> you feel free to invite folks that you know. If you have colleagues that you think would benefit from this, feel free to share the link. Um, if you know people that would be interested in this and wanna get on our email list, you can do that really on any page on our website. There's a sign up button and you know your friends are our friends. So feel free to pass that along to, to everybody else. And without any further ado, Joe Lynn, good to see you again. Sounds good. Thank you, Alan and Jacob. So welcome everybody to Excel Beyond the Basics. Um, I want to jump right in because there's a lot of different topics that I really want to discuss today. Uh, just so everybody knows that I am using the 365 version of Excel, um, but I'm actually using the desktop version today. Uh, the desktop version, of course, is the uh, version that will have all the bells and whistles, uh, although the online version does have a lot to it. And most of the things that we talk about are available in the online version as well. Um, but the first thing that I actually want to talk to you about today is going to be using uh, different types of named ranges. Named ranges is a feature built into Excel that I hear people say, yeah, I kind of tried them and I wasn't quite sure if I would use them or not, or I don't understand what they are at all or what their benefit is. So the first topic today is going to be named ranges because named ranges really carry over to other elements that we do in Excel. Um, I'll talk about those benefits as we go through the whole entire session today because I will be using named ranges periodically throughout the session. So first off, a name of a cell is typically what you refer to as an example of G2. We refer to it as the column letter, the row number, and everybody understands that. At the top left, underneath the ribbon, you find the name box. The name box always tells you the name of your active cell. But we're gonna take that a lot further today because what happens with that named cell is sometimes we actually want to use a range of cells in a formula. And sometimes we want to copy that formula and only refer to a specific cell in that formula. You may be familiar with the term absolute reference. If you don't know the official name that Microsoft calls it, um, using dollar signs to lock down a cell in a formula so that when you copy it, it will stay on that specific cell. Well, you may not have realized this, but one of the benefits of naming a cell is it becomes an absolute reference by default. So as an example, the, uh, I'm looking at a references worksheet. It's got some salespeople. I only put a couple in here for it to make it easy, but I want to create a formula for the commission. And I want to create the formula once, then I want to be able to copy it down for all of the other employees. And imagine if I had 10,000 employees, I want to be able to just double click on the fill handle and copy that formula down. Well, if I'm going to be referencing a single cell, I would need to use dollar signs to lock that cell down so that when it copies it, it's going to stay on that cell. So this may sound familiar for something that you have done in the past. But what I find when I do support with companies is that people will look at a formula that has dollar signs and they don't quite understand it. So not everybody knows them and understands them. So I have an easier way for you. Something that will make it easier to read a formula 
and it's going to also be easier to create formulas if you are always creating formulas based on the same range of cells we can name that range of cells so that we don't have to worry about going back and selecting it over and over and over again as we create different formulas i do that a lot with excel dashboards so let's talk about how to name a cell and then i'll show you how to use it and i'll keep talking about the benefits so first before we create it there's a couple of rules on naming cells um, cells cannot have a space in the name you can use uppercase lowercase in the name um, to help identify multiple words if you want you can have up to 255 characters but only 200 no 256 characters in the name but only 255 could show up in the name box we won't worry about all those kind of details it's kind of crazy the rules we have but the big thing is don't put any spaces and don't try and name it the same as a cell reference so like qtr1 qtr1 is a cell because as you know, we have over 16,000 columns going across and over a million rows going down. So you have to be careful if you abbreviate at all. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're naming. So I'm gonna click on G2 and I'm going to name this cell commission rate by clicking in the name box. This is one place that I can go to to name a cell. So I'm gonna physically type commission rate. No spaces, I'm capitalizing the C and the R all I have to do is press enter. Now that cell is named commission rate. If I wanna to go to column G and create a formula to calculate the commission for each one of the salespeople, I'm gonna of course start with equal. I'm gonna choose my total sales for the per first employee. I'm gonna do my multiplication. Then I'm gonna type the letters CO. CO is going to narrow my list down of all the functions that begin with the letters CO, but notice that there's actually two cell or two others, commission rate and COMM rate that are named cells in this workbook. The one I just created is the full word commission rate. Notice that their icon on the left hand side looks different. If it's a function built into Excel, it's got the circle with the FX. Otherwise, if it's a named range, it's going to have the spreadsheet looking squares. I'm going to double click on commission rate to add that to my formula. Notice that it automatically color codes with that cell G2. I'm going to control enter to stay on that cell. I'm going to copy that formula down for the other employees. And each one of these will then read taking that total sales multiplied by that commission rate. So right away, that's easier to understand what the formula is doing. Plus, I could copy it down without having those dollar signs. So if the commission rate changes on cell G2 to 6%, all of the formulas related to it will update. Even formulas that are on different worksheets. Let me show you an example. I'm gonna to go to the worksheet called Lookup and I wanna create a formula that's going to be based on that percentage coming from the references worksheet. So I'm gonna say that I wanna take the earnings from D6 and divide it, no, I'm sorry, multiply it by commission rate. I'm gonna do the same thing, that CO, I'm gonna double click on commission rate. It's reading the commission rate from the other worksheet if I do control enter, I'll stay on that cell and the formula is calculating based on that commission rate back on the other worksheet. Therefore, a named range, named cell, can be used in any of your worksheets within that workbook. And <laughs> let me take this just a step further. Another benefit is we can navigate by a named range. If I go back to the name box, click on the drop down arrow. A lot of people tell me they didn't even realize that down arrow was there. But if you click on that down arrow, you're going to see a list of named ranges that are active, keyword active in this workbook. If I click on discount table, it's going to take me directly to the worksheet to the range of cells that it has been named discount rate. Discount rate. So pretty cool how all this works together. So named ranges are going to be extremely beneficial if you're going to be navigating, 
you want to copy a formula, you want a formula to be easier to read, but let me go to the orders worksheet. And I'm going to be creating a couple of formulas that are going to be based on all of the numbers in the extended price column. And I don't even know how, well, I know, but you may not know how long that column is, how many rows of data are there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to name the range of cells and I'm going to call it extended price, just what it is, and then I can use them in formulas. So I'm going to go to cell I2. I'm going to select all the way down to the end of my numbers by doing shift control down arrow. Shift control down arrow is a keyboard shortcut that we can use to navigate and select at the same time. Shift control down arrow. Now that I have all of those numbers selected, I'm going to go back to the name box again, and I'm going to put in the name that I want to name that range. And as I said, I'm going to name it extended price and press enter. So now that I have that range of cells entered, if I want to do a little summary analysis and do different calculations that are based on that extended price, I don't have to actually go back and keep selecting it. All I have to do is create the formulas and put in that named range. So I'm going to actually create a formula that's just going to do a sum of all of the extended price. So I know everybody knows how to do the auto sum. That's pretty basic. So I'm going to click auto sum, and then I'm going to tell it that I want to sum the extended price. So I did EX. I can see extended price. I'm going to control enter. And I'm going to see what the answer is of adding together all of those numbers for that range called extended price. And I'm going to create another formula. I'm going to go to cell L1. And I'm going to create a formula that is going to be using a subtotal function. Now, if you're not familiar with all of the different functions that are built into Excel, if you go to the formulas tab of the ribbon, you're, you're going to find a function library group with all the different categories of the different functions. So depending on your version of Excel, there's over 400 functions built in. So they're categorized to make it easier to find the function that you want. So wouldn't be a bad idea to spend a little bit of time in there, because what's really great is if you go to any of these categories and you hesitate on any of the names of these functions, you get a screen tip telling you what it is, and it breaks down the, the arguments, the syntax of the formula. Plus, if you need more information, click on that tell me more. So spend some time there. But I'm going to do the subtotal function, which by the way, everything I'm talking about will be in that handout that Alan mentioned, just so you know. So what I'm going to do is on cell L1, I'm going to do equal SU, because SU will bring up a list of functions that begin with those letters, I'm going to double click on subtotal. What the subtotal function does is multiple functions. It doesn't just do average, count, max, min, sum. It has a list of several different functions. There's 11, 11 different functions that a subtotal can do. So what I'm going to do is a sum. I want to do a sum of the extended price. And I'll explain why I'm doing it this way. So what I'm going to do is double click on the 9-sum. 9 is a hidden code to the computer. You know, it reads numbers. <laughs> um, a hidden code to the computer to let it know that I want to do a sum. So after that, I have to separate it, my arguments with a comma. Then it wants to know what are the cells that I want to add together. And I'm going to use that same extended price, that named range called extended price. I'm going to control enter. I get exactly the same answer. So why would I ever want to use a subtotal function instead of an auto sum or the sum function itself if I'm going to get exactly the same answer? Let's see why. We have a range of data in this worksheet that is a bunch of company orders. You could have 10 rows of data, you could have 400, you could have a million rows of data, it doesn't matter. Usually you wanna analyze that data in some way, shape or form. 
And a very popular option is to filter and sort that data. So I'm going to click anywhere within my range of cells, my data, my data source is what I usually call it. So once I'm within my data source, I'm going to turn filters on by going to my data tab of the ribbon. I know you could do it from the home tab also, but I do it from here because it's more easy. <laughs> I just try and find the most efficient way to do things. So I'm going to click on the filter icon. From mm -hmm. here is, yes. Sorry, a quick question no here from Peter. Yes. He says, what if I add information to the extended price after naming the range? What a great idea. That's going to depend on how you add it. And that's actually a super good question, because if I go to the bottom, unless it's a table, unless it's actually turned into a table, which that's another session, but um, it would add it if you had it as a table and you added it to the bottom. But in this case, if you insert a new row, it can be added then to your data. If you're adding it in between existing, but if you add it to the end, it's not just going to magically add it. You would have to go back and change things. OK, so if possible, add it within your current range. Very good question. There's other tricks to that, but we'll save that for another day. <laughs> so when I turned these filters on, it gave us drop down arrows for each of our column headings. And it doesn't matter that it's row one. It's really just looking at our connected data source where there's empty columns, empty rows of data, and it knows they're together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply filters. Now, can I assume people have probably done sorting and filtering before? I'm going to take it a little bit further than your basic, um, but let me do it this way. I want to go to salesperson because this is a pretty common thing that can end up happening. Um, let's say I have this salesperson called Andrew Fuller, but somebody entered it as Andy. That's two different people, Andrew, Andy. So one of the things that I love about the filter is clicking on the drop down arrow and seeing the unique values that are within that specific column. So I'm going to see if there's anybody's names that are misspelled. I, I live in Wisconsin and we have a lot of names of cities that are very easily misspelled. So this has helped me throughout the years to be able to see if anybody had misspellings within the data. So we could clearly see that we don't have Andrew Fuller and Andy because they would, would have been listed twice. So I like filters just for that capability. But let's say that I only want to see, um, let's say that I want to see Andrew Fuller and Laura Callahan. I'm going to unselect all. I'm going to choose Andrew and Laura Callahan, and I'm going to click OK. You've probably done a filter that way before, where you're going to see blue letters on the left hand side. It's hiding the rows that don't match your criteria. And if you look at the status bar at the bottom left, it's going to show you on the status bar how many total records there are and how many total match our criteria. So there's three, 354 total for Andrew and Laura Callahan. OK, but let me take that further. I only want to see if the quantity of their orders was 100 or more. I can do that by going to the drop down arrow for quantity, hesitating on number filter. The computer is very smart, by the way. It understands if there's text, if there's dates, if there's numbers within your columns. So it knows there's numbers in this column. So it gives you advanced filtering choices that are number related. And I want to only have greater than or equal to 100. So I'm going to click greater than or equal to. Then in the dialog box, I can enter 100 and then click OK. Now, are you noticing what's happening? I mentioned the left hand side and the status bar, but look at my subtotal function. My formula in K1 has not changed because the sum automatically stays the original sum of the range. But L1, where I used a subtotal, that number has been changing every time I filter because it's really the subtotal of the current records that I'm seeing not all of the records in the data source, only the current ones that I'm seeing. 
So if I go back to salesperson and I clear that filter, it's automatically going to update because the total in L1 is now based on only the quantities being 100 or more. So the subtotal adjusts every single time. So I could have a subtotal that's giving me the average of my current records, the maximum of my current records, the minimum of, of my current records. You get the idea because a subtotal function can do more than just one function. It could do 11 different types of functions and we didn't have to memorize them. If you recall, when I did this formula, when I did that number nine, it actually gave me a drop down list of all of the names of the functions it can do. I did some, but if I wanted average, I would use the number one. Then when I press enter, it's going to give me the total, the answer for only the current records for that average of all of those. So it's pretty cool how these work. And having that named range was easier if I'm going to be creating multiple types of functions, because then I'm not going back and having to select all those cells over and over and over again. Okay, so something to be thinking about. And like I said, your handout will include everything that I just mentioned, sorting, filtering, named ranges, subtotals. But let's actually take this a little bit further and talk about a couple of other types of functions that are built into Excel and use named ranges in coordination with those. I'm going to go to the worksheet called dates. And in this worksheet called dates, I'm going to do a couple of different things with you here. First, I'm going to go to cell E1 and I'm going to create a formula that's going to give me today's date. It's called today. The function is actually called today. So I'm going to put in equal TO. I'm going to double click on the today. It doesn't have any arguments. It's only got the right and the left paren. I'm going to control enter and I get today's date. Why would I ever do that? Why would I do it as a formula versus just typing in the date? Well, I want it to say whatever the current date is. So by using it as a formula, it's going to update every day that I come in here and give me whatever the current date is. And I'm actually going to use it in a formula. So first, I'm going to name this cell. I'm going to name this cell. Another rule, by the way, of naming cells is each name has to be unique. There can't be two named ranges with the same name. So I'm on E1. I'm going to go to the name box, and I'm going to name this today's date. And then press Enter. So I just named that cell and now I'm going to use it in a formula to calculate the years of service that all of these employees have had to the organization based on today's date so that it will automatically update every time I look at this. So I'll know if somebody had 25 years or 26 years or 10 years or two years, whatever the case would be. And it's going to be based on their hire date. So based on today's date, and their hire date. But I'm going to use another function. And I'm actually going to use the same function twice in the formula. So what I'm going to do first is equal, I'm going to use the function called year, because I want it to pull out just the year out of a date. I don't want days, I want years of service. So I'm going to use the function called year. And all it wants to know is what is the date so I'm going to use my named range called today's date. So that's the first part of this formula. I wanted to take today's date and subtract based on the year coming from their date of hire. So I'm going to use the function called year again. I'm using it twice. And then I'm just going to be referencing cell D4. So really what this formula is doing is taking the year from today's date and subtracting the year from their data higher. If I didn't use the function year, it's going to calculate based on days of service. Yes, there's other ways to calculate this formula, but we'll leave it at this for right now. I'll control enter. I get a date because the computer is so smart that it understood that I was doing a date formula. 
but I want it to be formatted as just a general number. So I'm going to go back to the home tab. I'm going to go to the number group, click on the drop down next to date, and I'm just going to choose general. So I get no decimals. I just want general. OK, so I have 37 years for the first employee. I want all of those employees to have the same calculation. So I'm going to actually go to the fill handle at the bottom right of this cell, double click, copies the formula all the way down. Imagine if you had 10,000 employees, that calculation just copied all the way down. And each one of them is using that named range for that today's date. Okay, So it's smart enough to copy that down correctly. Otherwise, it would have gone from E1 to E2 to E3 to E4, et cetera, going down when you copy that formula. But because it was a named range, it was an absolute reference. OK, so a couple of different things that I just wanted to kind of show you on how we can use that named range to be able to do different types of formulas. And I wanted to throw in a couple of other categories of types of formulas. But this time, I want to do a couple of other things. What I want to do is show you a feature called the Flash Fill. Flash Fill is available on the Data tab of the ribbon in the Data Tools group. And what this, func this command, I should, it's not a function, <laughs> what this command does is it will analyze the pattern of what we're telling it to do. And it can pull information from another cell. It can combine information from multiple cells. Let's see an example of how this feature called Flash Fill works. I'm going to go to cell I4. And what I want the computer to do is to grab the extension, which is the last four numbers in column H. I wanted to grab that 2099, 2770, et cetera all coming from column H. What I need to do is first give it my pattern. So I'm going to do 2099. I'm going to control enter to stay on that cell. I'm going to click on the icon for the flash fill from the data tab of the ribbon, and it follows my pattern all the way down. So it understood that there were numbers within my data source that matched this number. So it automatically has copied those down for me without me doing anything. I clicked on an icon. Another example, I'm going to go to J4. And in that same column H, I want to grab out the where it says lab, central, central, HQ, et cetera. I wanted to follow my pattern with that and populate, populate it all the way down. I'm going to do LAB for the first one for lab. I'm going to control enter again. I'm going to click on my flat flash fill icon, and it automatically has copied those all the way down to the end of the employee list. It's really a great tool that we have built into Excel that we got a couple of versions ago. It is, to me, one of the best features that it has really come out in the past couple of versions. But let me show you how it really shines. If I go over to A4, if you look at this data source of employees, when it came out of the AS400 or wherever it came out of, um, or when it was hand entered, it came out with capital letters for the first name and the last name. And what we want to do is combine together the first and the last, because we want to be able to see first name space last name, or we could do last name comma space first name, however you want it to be organized. So what I'm going to do is I have to give it the pattern and I'm going to give it the casing I want. So I want it to be title case. I want it to have a capital E for Erica, a capital D for Decker. So that's how I need to type it in. So the computer with the flash fill will follow my pattern. So I'm going to type in Erica space Decker. Control enter again. Then I'm going to click on my icon for flash fill. It automatically follows my pattern. And it followed my casing as well, which is fantastic that it does that. Now, you may or may not be familiar with a few other types of functions built into Excel called text functions.
So back here on the formulas tab, if I go to the text group, there's formulas here that I could have used to do everything that I just did. Concatenate is a way that we can combine information together and put in different characters like commas. We have proper. Proper is how I could have changed it to the title case. Or I could have said lower for lowercase. I could have used left to pull information from the left hand side of a cell or right to pull things in from the right hand side of a cell. So we could have done this with text. But if this data is not going to change, this is data that I'm going to use right now and it's not going to change, flash fill is easier, it's quicker. So I use flash fill most of the time. But if I know that this information is going to change regularly, I might want to do it with a formula, because if we do it with a formula, it will automatically update. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to go back to I4. And I'm going to change this to be a formula using a function called write, R-I-G-H-T. So I'm going to do equal R and I'm going to double click on the function called write. First, it wants to know what is the cell that has the text that I want. It's text related, even though I'm grabbing a number. So I'm going to click on H4 because that's the cell that I want to get the information from. Comma, I need to tell it how many characters from the right hand side of the cell I want. And I want four. So I'm going to put in a four. I'm going to control enter and it's going to give me the 2099. Notice that it left justified it because it's seen it as text. Because it's a text function, it saw it as text. Now, if I copy that formula down for all of the employees, I'm going to get the same answer. But the benefit to doing it as a formula would be if I go back to H4 and this person actually changed their extension, it's 3400. As soon as I update that 3400, the formula will update. If I kept it as the flash fill, it would not update. I would have to go back and re flash fill it after I made the changes to the data. So I still love flash fill, even though it doesn't update. Sometimes I just go back and re flash fill it. It's not that big of a deal. But if you know the data is going to change regularly, you might want to consider the text related instead. OK, well, let's go to another formula. I'm going to go to the worksheet called lookup. Very common in Excel is to have a range of data like we were talking about with our orders, and we want to find something within that range of data. So maybe I'm the help desk in HR and somebody calls up and first thing we ask is, well, what's your employee ID number? We can type in that employee ID number and it's going to populate all the data related to that employee. Well, we have a couple of formulas that are already created using a function called a V lookup. V stands for vertical. So what it does is it looks vertically across the range of data. And it always is looking at the data. It has to look up the data coming from the column furthest to the left of the range of cells. And by the way, in the syntax of the formula, the range of cells is going to be called a table array. It's a fancy way of saying range of cells. <laughs> we'll leave it as that for now. But if you look at my results data at the top of my actual employee information, I have a formula on B6 that is locating the person's name coming from column B of the data source. So what it's doing to break apart this formula is it's doing a lookup based on whatever ID is in A6. It's looking within the table array, otherwise known as range of cells, called employee underscore info. Employee underscore info is a named range related to all of this employee data. Employee underscore info. And then it's looking in the second column of that employee data. So the second column is the name. When we think about that range of cells that we're having it look in, the employee ID is the first column, the name is the second. So we have to put in a two to tell it to go to the second column. Let's see another example. 
If you look at C6, I have a formula that's looking up that same employee ID number. But this time what it's doing is it's looking up whatever department that employee is in. So in this case, it's got the same lookup, it's got the same table array, but now it's actually getting the answer from the fifth column. So five columns across from the left first column. And then the earnings is doing the same thing, but it's grabbing the earnings from the sixth column. What I'm going to do is demonstrate the region. I'm going to go to cell E6 and I'm going to create a lookup. So I'm going to say equal V. I'm going to double click on V lookup. What it's looking for right now, the syntax of this is it's looking for the lookup value. I want it to look up that employee ID number, comma, where do I want it to look up that information? It's coming from that employee underscore info. So when I type an E, I can then double click to select employee underscore info, which is a named range of all that data. So I don't have to keep going back and selecting and selecting and selecting. It's already built in as a named range for me because I did that earlier. Comma, I needed to actually get the region. Employee ID is the first column, name is the second, SSN is the third. I want the region coming from the fourth column. So I'm going to put in a four. Now, I haven't mentioned what came after that, by the way. If I do a comma, I can choose true or false. I had false in the previous formulas. And what that does is tells the computer to find an exact match. If it doesn't find the employee ID number as an exact match in the list, we will get an error message. And usually I would add an error, if error do this. So I do an if error along with this function, but for ease of use today, I'm just gonna double click on false to tell it an exact match, control enter, and it's going to find the region for that specific employee. But notice if I go back, and I change the employee ID number, which by the way, I have it set up as data validation list. So it's a list. I could choose whichever employee ID I want and every one of these formulas will automatically update. So lookup functions are very popular for locating information within a range of cells. Great feature. Now, I did have a couple of other examples. I'm only going to show you one more on the V lookup. I'm going to go to this worksheet. And what we have is a list of amounts and a list of discount percentages. And what I want to do is look up the purchase amount. So if somebody had um, orders and their order was within a specific range, they can get a percent of a discount based on their total sale or their subtotal sale. So what I wanted to look up is A6. I want to create a formula that's going to use this lookup table here with these percentages to find the appropriate percent. So I'm going to be on B6. I'm going to create another V lookup. I'm going to create a formula using that V lookup. My lookup value is going to be A, I'm sorry, A6, <laughs> comma, the table array, the range of cells that I wanted to look in is going to be, and I could do either A9 through B25, or I could have just done A10 through B29. It doesn't need the heading in there. Either way, I'll select that range, comma, the second column in that selected range holds the discount percent, so I want two. But then after that second column, I'm going to put in a comma. I need to tell it true. It does true by default, but I'm going to double click on true because I want it to give me an approximate match. The reason being is because there's not every number. Because what if their total sales was only $100? There isn't $100 in my list. So it's going to drop down to the next lowest number. So it's doing an approximate lookup. I'm going to control enter. And here it found 15%. There is not a 5,500 in my table, in my list. So it dropped down to the 5,000 and found 
If I put change that purchase amount to 100, they're going to get 0%. If I put that purchase amount as being 90,000, it's going to drop down to the 50,000 mark from 100,000 down to the 50,000 mark because there's no other numbers in between that. So sometimes you want to be using that true or that false, but it does true by default, does true by default. But if you want it to find an exact match, and if it doesn't, you want it to give you an error, make sure you're using false. Okay, make sure you use false. Well, enough of those lookups for right now. Let's actually jump to another category, which by the way, flash fill, all these functions that I just talked about, plus a couple of others are actually going to be located in your book, located in that handout. Uh, another topic that you have in your handout is talking about using charts. I'm going to assume everybody has probably created a chart before, and there's tons of different ways to create a chart. Let me just create one very briefly for you um, using a shortcut because of course I like shortcuts. I'm going to the references worksheet and I'm gonna say that I wanna create a chart that's based on A4 through E7. To create a chart, you select your range of data. But have you ever noticed that when you select a range of cells, you're automatically getting an icon at the bottom right? That icon is actually called the quick analysis because Excel understands that when you select a range of cells, there's certain things you probably want to be doing. So if I click on that icon from here, I could apply conditional formatting based on my range of cells. I could do a chart based on my range of cells. I could have it create formulas for me based on my range of cells. I could have it create a table or even create cute little spark lines. But I'm going to click chart. So this is another way to create a chart. I want just a standard cluster. Click on that and it automatically gives me a chart in the middle of my worksheet, just like you normally would if you went to the insert tab of the ribbon. So I'm going to assume everybody has probably already created a chart because this is a very popular feature built into Excel and I love charts. I actually do a full day class just on charts because they're so popular, but I do them a lot with data tables and working with pivot tables and things like that. But let me take this a little bit further because there's more to charts than sometimes we don't understand. So what I'm going to do is go to a worksheet called maps. I'm not sure if you knew that Excel works with geographical data. It has maps built in to the chart options, plus there's an additional 3D map choice. I'm just going to stick to the basics today. I'm going to select this range of data up at the top left by doing control A when I'm selected inside a cell. It's a bunch of states with their visitor counts. The computer is going to automatically create a map showing those states. By me going to the insert tab of the ribbon in the charts group, I'm going to click maps. Then I'm going to click filled map. It automatically has created a chart in the middle of the worksheet based on the data that I selected. So what it's doing is a granulate color scale based on the largest numbers down to the smallest numbers based on those visitor counts. It's smart enough to do that. So it's color coding those. Now, of course, you do get your chart design tab. So if you want to kind of change the formatting of your chart and use different colors and things, you most certainly could. But that was something that I had really wished that Microsoft would add in to the program for years, which by the way, Ellen, I've been using other programs. I came into the IT world before the mouse came out. <laughs> That's really aging myself, sorry. <laughs> but I just love the ability of being able to do this. I don't have to go to another program to create a map based on geographical data. It's pretty cool. But I also have some country information here that I want to work with. Usually I would be going to the insert tab and I would actually be using a 3D map because it's more intelligent, it's an add-in program. But let me just show you how this would work if I selected this data, I could still be using map and use a filled map. It would do it based on the geographical countries that I was using in my uh, range of cells as well. So it's not just for USA, US states, it's for anywhere. 
I love these. These are wonderful. They're so easy to use. All you have to do is have the data entered correctly, which sometimes that could be a struggle. So make sure your data is accurate. So as you are outputting your data, it will be accurate as well. Okay. Unbelievable features built into Excel. Next topic that I want to talk is about, about connecting data. We have a feature built into Excel called Consolidate. Some people have said to me, yeah, I've seen it on the ribbon before, didn't understand it, so I stayed away from it. It's located on the data tab of the ribbon in the data tools group, this icon called Consolidate. I've had people read this and still not understand what the benefit of it was. But let me talk about the benefits. So we talked about filtering our data. We talked about getting subtotals. We talked about doing a sum on that data. Well, how is this going to be different? We talk about doing all kinds of different formulas, and formulas can go across multiple sheets, which when we do that, a lot of times they're called a 3D formula. So let me show you an example. We have two worksheets here, one called January calls, one called February calls. They're set up with the same call centers and the same hours, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Both worksheets are set up the same. I want to consolidate this data together. And I do this every year with my January through December data. I do this consolidate every single year. So I'm going to go to my January, February call totals. I have a blank area already set up that I'm going to be adding together all of the numbers from those other two sheets and put the answers here for each one of the call centers based on each of the hours. But before I do that, you may have created a 3D formula before, where if I have the totals for each call center, I could calculate those totals from the January calls and the February calls. I have it down here in row 14. This is a sum of each time frame. I'm going to add those together and put those here on the January calls, January, February calls. By going to cell C21, I'm going to create a 3D formula. I'm going to say equal. I'm going to go to January calls. I'm going to click on the total for 9 a.m. I'm going to do a plus. I'm going to go to the worksheet called February calls. I'm going to click on the total for 9 a.m and I'm going to do control enter. Control enter is gonna take me back to that worksheet where I started creating the formula. And because I did control enter, it stayed on the cell. And it added together from the January calls, C14 plus February calls worksheet, C14. If you look at my formula bar, it gives you the name of the worksheet. So they call that a 3D formula. Well, because of the way these are set up, I can copy that formula across for each of the different time frames. So I'm going to take this formula, use my fill handle, copy it across for 9 p.m. And it's going to give me the total for each one of those time frames for all of the different call centers. You may have done something like this in the past. What I don't like about what I just did was, how do I know what the individual numbers are that are making up this sum? I don't know right now. What are the individual numbers? Well, with the consolidate feature that we have built into Excel, we can. We can actually drill in and see the individual numbers that are going to make up the total. Let me show you how this works. How to, how to use this uh, consolidate feature. First, I'm going to select the blank cells the blank cells where I want the answers to appear. They have to be the same number of columns across and the same number of rows going down. Then I'm going to go to the data tab, click on the icon called consolidate. In the consolidate, it can do more than just a sum, but up at the top, I have sum, average, count, max, min, those kind of things. I'm going to leave it on sum. What I need to tell the computer is what is the range of cells from which worksheets do I want to add together? So for me, I always do January through December. I add them all together. So I'm going in the references box. I'm going to click on January calls. I'm going to select the range of cells matching that 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And it's adding it to my references, that same range. 
I'm going to click the button for add to add it to the all references box. I do that for each worksheet that I want to bring in and consolidate together. I'm going to go to the February calls. It's smart enough to select that same range of cells, but if it happened to be different columns, I could go ahead and select those columns. But mine's exactly the same, so I'm going to keep that. I'm going to click add. So I could do that for, you know, March, April, May, June, all of however many I have. And they can be coming from different workbooks. Just so you know, I could go to a different workbook and grab cells. It doesn't have to be within the same sheet. Work, workbook, I should say. Could go to a different workbook. But I'm going to click this create links to source data because I want to be able to drill in and see what the individual values were coming from February and January calls. When I'm done, I click OK. I automatically see the answers of adding those numbers together from those two other sheets for each of the call times and the regions. On the left hand side, I'll, you'll notice that I have missing numbers and I have num uh, plus signs next to it. This is called outlining. And what I can do is go to the number seven, which is the total for Northeast. I can see that it's actually adding together C5 through C6. Well, what numbers are those? If I go to the plus sign next to row seven, it expands it out. And if I click on either one of these numbers and look at the formula bar, I can see where the number is coming from. I know that that number is coming from the February calls. This number is coming from the January calls. They're linked to those and I can drill in and individually see them because they might be coming from a different workbook. I can't just go to it and look at it. Plus, who wants to do that? I don't want to have to go there and find it and look at it. Here, I have it automatically. And they're connected. So if the data changes, so if we go back and we got audited for February, and I found out that C5 for the Northeast was really supposed to be 25,000. It's at 10,000 right now. I'm going to change that to 25,000. As soon as I press Enter, it has now updated it back on the totals worksheet. So now it says 25,000. So everything gets updated automatically. If I don't need to see the individual values, I'll click on the minus sign next to seven, and it's going to shrink that value back up. So we can always be collapsing and expanding as needed with this data, and it stays connected. But so does row 39 for me. So the total for 9 AM now updated because I did a 3D formula coming from those January calls and I changed the number. But here, I just can't see what the individual values were. With the consolidate, I can. So for me, that has become a very popular tool that I've been using for quite a few years. You know, I don't even know. I think it might have been at least 18 years, 19 years probably that I've been using that feature. I think it's been out since the first version. We just didn't realize how important that feature was or how to really utilize it. So Excel has all of these wonderful tools built in. Encourage you to kind of look around and really just kind of see what it is that you need to be using to make sure that you're not doing things the long way around. There's a lot of different shortcuts and a lot of different ways to do things. So we can come up with lots of different ways to do things. There's never a wrong answer, but being more efficient is a good choice. Try and find an, the easiest way to do things, find the shortcuts. Named ranges is huge for me. So if you've never done named ranges before, highly recommend them. So Alan, do we have any questions from the audience today? <clears throat> You know, we, we do, um, Joe Lynn, some of these I think we may have answered in chat, but I, I think they're they're good questions and we should probably share the answers. And the first one, a couple of people have asked where the handout will be located. And so just to sort of <clears throat> reiterate that, um, we have a training library on, on our website, which is compuworks.biz. Uh, just navigate to the training library. You'll see all of the past sessions that we've done. We should have this session up uh, there tomorrow along with the workbook. Um, so you can uh, you can access it there. 
So another question on the map feature, which by the way, I had no idea that Excel did anything like that. So that was quite enlightening. Um, the question is, does the map feature go down to the state, county, city level or only nationwide? Let me show you. So if I have La Crosse County and that's in Wisconsin and I put in a value, just kind of throw just a couple of uh, uh, things out here. Juno County, Wisconsin, and I'll put in 4,000. Let me throw that into a map here and show you what's going to happen. And I'll just use the same mapping program, field map. It's pretty smart. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> so I found my two counties. Wow. And does it get right down to the city or what's the smallest yes. granular level city? Yeah. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Okay, so interesting cool. stuff. Very but it cool. needs to know because, of course, there's um, two lacrosse Wisconsin, uh, two lacrosses. So we have to specify the Wisconsin in there because there's a Texas mm -hmm. lacrosse as well and mm -hmm. Nevada. And so you have to make sure that you're specifying the uh, state with it. Yep. Yep. Okay. okay. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, anybody else have any questions? Feel free to get them into the Q&A box here. Um, we do just have uh, one more at the moment, and this is maybe a little bit outside of the scope of the, the session. I don't think you covered this. You didn't cover this today, but the question was um, about the data, valida data validation. Mm -hmm. And uh, is, uh, uh, Nina asks, she says, uh, I'm curious about how to automatically color code lists if possible. Color code lists. Um, depending on the color coding that you actually would like to do, um, data validation is more of validating the information that's being physically entered or that's already there. So it really wouldn't be data validation that would do the color coding. It would be more of the conditional formatting. So as an example, I'll just select these numbers. Um, if I wanted certain numbers to be uh, formatted, I would be going to my conditional formatting to do that whether it's based on top bottom numbers, it's based on different types of um, equal to, greater than, that kind of a thing, or I could just be using data bars, color scales. That's all part of conditional formatting, okay? But that's a great question. So data validation doesn't do color coding, except for a red circle around things that are not valid. Yep, okay. and we use this all the time. This conditional formatting in uh, yes. dashboards that we um, we have, yes. I think, is a pretty common use for it. You know, you want certain ranges to light up in green and others to light up in red, and it just makes it easier to just look at it and at a glance, kind of, kind of know how you're doing. Yes, okay. and we can have more than one condition applied to it as well. Yep, yep. Okay. Um, hopefully that helped Nina and I don't see any other questions. So unless anybody wants to sneak one under the wire, um, I think we'll go ahead and, and wrap this up. Uh, I did wanna just maybe show the slide that uh, gives you guys a little bit of a heads up on the upcoming uh, sessions. Oops. I think that it's one? the last one. Oh, I'm uh, sorry, I went the yeah. wrong way. <laughs> yeah, no, this yeah, <laughs> that's the one. There it is. Okay, yep. So here, here's what we got have coming up on the schedule. Uh, we may be adding a few to this. Um, you know, we'll see. And again, feel free to respond to the survey with any suggestions you might have. So in July, we've got the Word 101, uh, which Jacob mentioned, and I fully expect this to be very similar to the Excel 101, where I'll I'll take it and think I know everything and wind up knowing very little about Word. <laughs> um, and then in August we have Microsoft Visio. So so, you know, this is a, if you're not familiar with, with Visio, it's a flow charts and organizational charts kind of, that's how I think of it, JoLynn, is that kind of it, you know? It is, but it's so much more than that, but we'll get an introduction going first, get people comfortable yep. with it, and then we can always do a beyond the basics later. Yep. And then September, uh, we'll do the uh, companion to the July class, Word Beyond the Basics. Uh, and then in October, we're going to do a Windows 11 session. So that should be interesting for folks as we all sort of make that move into the, the new world of Windows 11. Um, so that's really it for today. Thanks, everybody, for coming. This was a great session. I learned a ton. Uh, thank you all for being here. And we'll, we'll see you all soon. Thanks, Jolene. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye. Bye.